Man, it does my heart so, it feels so good to hear the church sing that great old hymn of the church. I love, you guys sound amazing. <laughs> That's not an old hymn of the church. I'm going to love you. <laughs> Jeff, I was watching you behind the curtain there. Jeff says, I'm going, <laughs> that was good. You were singing too. I mean, it was awesome. Guys, welcome to church on Sunday May the 2nd, God's month has arrived. Oh, goodness. I'll be a couple more weeks. I'm out of my 50th year. I'm going to 51. Yes, I feel good. I've had just a little coffee, but I'm feeling incredible today. I'm so thankful that my wife is not in love with my hair. With that said, if you have your Bibles, turn to Colossians chapter 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Severe will give it up for our Greensboro campus this morning. What's up, everybody? We got several people here. I'm just going to, I guess I'm going to bring one special person to our attention. Nisi, where are you from California? I know you're in this service. Are you here? What's up, girl? How are you doing? Have you... Have you moved here? You've moved here from California. You made a wise decision. Give it up for Nisi, everybody. Good to see you. You can be seated. We got people watching from everywhere. Thanks for tuning in. It's good to be in church as we close down a little series called Live, Laugh, and Love. I'm so thankful God would give me the creativity to think of that little three-word phrase that we've never heard before. Uh, before we jump into this last week of this series, and we're going to talk about love this week, let's talk about the next few weeks. Next week is our Make It Count offering. We are going to celebrate Mother's Day. Our kids will sing. It is a huge day in the life of our church for our Greensboro family as well as our online family. We're all giving above our tithes and offerings to expand our teen center. We are one church together. Uh, we have given to expand our Greensboro facilities and renovate. Well, we're all doing this together. Next week, we're taking an offering. And let me tell you, God is already on the move. It's going to be amazing. I can't wait to see what's going to happen for us to give above our tithes and offerings, to expand our teen center from 11,000 to 24,000 square feet, to tell our community, really us saying to God, we're not done. The greatest days of this church are not behind us. They're ahead of us. Even in the world in which we live, we're going to expand. We're going to thrive. We're going to make a difference. We're going to step out in faith. And I'm already trusting God. Trust me, it's already happening. It's going to be awesome. But all of us together doing it together make the difference. And so be prepared to give above your tithes and offerings next week. Don't not show up for church because we're taking a special offering. Some people go, I'll just watch it online next week. Don't do that. Be here. Be a part of it. It's going to be great. The kids are singing. I can't wait for that. I love when that's happening. We've got a great day for mothers. It's going to be fantastic as we kind of lock down and close down that make it count thought. Then after that, we're into a season of honor. For three weeks, I'm super pumped about it. We are going to be honoring our graduates, eighth grade graduates. Here in Sevier County, they typically have eighth grade graduation, but they're not doing that this year. We are going to honor eighth graders as well. I don't want them to get the raw end of the deal. We're going to be honoring teachers. Teachers have had a tough year, and I love our teachers. We need to make sure our teachers are appreciated and loved. We're going to be honoring our medical professionals through this season. We're going to be honoring our first responders. Our police officers need a lot of honor as well. Um, I've got my shirt on this week. The church has left the building. We'll talk about it in a minute. Honor has left the building in our society. We do not honor who we need to be honoring. And some of you are like, well, you're not honoring me. Well, we'll get to you someday. But we're going to honor all the way through Memorial Day. So be a part of church. I will say this in this service, and I'm going to say it in the next service. If you, some of you, can help us, we need about 50 people to 100 people in both services to, to really think about shifting to Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Wednesday night at 5.30, who would have thought we'd push over 500 people coming to church Wednesday night at 5.30? But 7 o'clock is one of those services where we want to keep it so we can grow it. We've already had right at 1,000 people before today. Uh, Saturday night is locked in, a great service to choose as well. But 7 o'clock is a service, especially when the kids get out of school, that I'm a little concerned about. I want us to uh, have a great experience. So if you can, especially coming in the summertime after Mother's Day, it gets squirrely. I get it. We all want to go to the camper or to the lake or to Cade's Cove, or we just want to go drive down the main drag of Pigeon Forge because there's no one there and we just love to drive and look. Um, 
Wednesday night at 7 is a great option. So I'm not going to ask you to sign anything, but just know uh, we are we are really needing some people to shift so we can make room. And especially, hey, you have your weekend free, but you're still doing the right thing as a Christian, and you're not. Well, <laughs> I don't know why that sounded creepy. Anyway, that sounds a little weird. So, and then after that, I'll say this. We will do one final road trip this summer. Uh, we had planned it last year. Uh, because of COVID, we couldn't do it. We'd done it for five years, but we all, we all had one road trip in mind to close the road trip thought down. Um, it could be the Eagles' Hell Freezes Over album. I'm not sure, but more than likely, this will be it for our road trips. We've got some great things into the future planned for summer times, but this year in particular is going to be good. It's going to be awesome. I might say it's the mother of all road trips. And you could have a 100 uh, rent me on the side of something. Uh, I'm just telling you, if you miss this summer, as we lock in destinations with spiritual applications, it is going to be next level. And I don't know about you, but all of us, after this year, we need to take a road trip together. So everybody in the RV, let's roll. All right, it's going to be amazing. So good stuff. Don't miss for the next two years. Don't miss church one time. The door is open. <laughs> Live, laugh, love. It's everywhere. The motto came from 1904. Bessie Stanley wrote a poem, an essay. She entered a contest. She won the contest in 1904. It paid her $250. She paid off her mortgage payment. Can you imagine if she would have taken that $250 and, and invested it in Bitcoin? Who would have? I mean... Dogecoin. I mean, who would have thought, right? Uh, but because of that poem, we have Live, Laugh, Love. You find it everywhere. And the poem says it pretty acutely. If you want to achieve success in life, the person that has success is not the person that has all the toys. It's a person that lives well, laughs often, and loves much. If you want your life to be an inspiration and you want your memory to be a benediction, by the way, tomorrow at noon, we'll have a funeral. We've had a lot of funerals lately. We'll have a funeral of Tom Current, 63 years old, I believe he was. He passed away of, of cancer. He was in this service. He was in the church every week, even through the last year. He did not want to miss church. I was so encouraged by him. And one of the reasons he says, I wanted to be in church every week for my church family. And he said, pastor, for you as well, I wanted to encourage you. And he was fighting terminal cancer. He passed away. He's in heaven today. He's probably having dinner with my dad later on this afternoon. I mean, he was a great, great man. And his funeral is tomorrow here at noon. And his memory will be a benediction. It will be a blessing. And so that's a great thought. We love that thought. And I, I went week one just a few weeks ago to say... God shows us what it's like to really live and laugh and love. You, you do that by giving. Christ gave his life for us. God gave his only son for us. And John the Baptist has this conversation right after Christ gives this great moment, John 3, 16 through 21. John the Baptist is arguing with a few people. They're saying, hey, John, are you, are you upset that Jesus is gaining popularity? He's baptizing more than you. And John makes this great statement for us in God's word. How do we achieve what we're really looking for in life? Christ has to become greater. I have to become lesser. Last week, we talked about joy and grace are linked. If you really want to be joyful, think of God's grace. Many of us, if we don't watch it, we get overwhelmed, and joy has left the building in our society. We're a, we're a lot of unhappy people. And I wonder why that is when it comes to Christians. So you're never more like God than when you give, when you live, when you laugh, and when you love. Love is a funny word, isn't it? Can you define love? All you need is love. Can you feel the love tonight? And I will always. Oh, Lord. I mean, I wrote them down. I could keep going. Love lift us up where we belong, where the eagles cry on a mountain high. Right? I mean, we could. I feel good, y'all. <laughs> love is a funny word, isn't it? I love my wife. I've been married to my wife 31 years in July. 
But I love cheese fries from the outback as well. I love my dog. I love the UT Vols most of the time. <laughs> Greensboro for you guys. I love my Tar Heels most of the time. I love my country. I love the beach. I love the lake. You're like, well, boy, we have decaffeinated that term, haven't we? I Somebody walked out last night at church. She goes, you know, I equate it to real love and pizza love. I never thought of it like that. Some of us, I love pizza, and I love you. Wow. <laughs> Means a lot. <laughs> Somebody wrote this. I think it's interesting. If you ask our culture, you'll discover that love is something you make on occasions. We went there. Love is something you fall into other times. I just fell into it. It's been known to produce broken hearts and goosebumps, loss of appetite and the starry eyes. It's inspired some to die and others to kill. <laughs> Love may make the world go round, but it certainly causes a lot of confusion along the way. So this is why you have me. I research. I found some incredible definitions of love. So much so, really, what's on this paper is perfect. It really needs no explanation. We can be done with the message right after this. So we'll all head to the outback together <laughs> on a Tuesday at 3 when there's a seven-hour wait. Anyway, um, anyway, somebody said this. This really brings it home. It says, love is love. End of story. Thank you. I got it. Perfect. Uh, love is a game of attrition. It's when two people stay together and bother one another long enough until one of them perishes. That is beautiful. Some of y'all like, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Some people say love is in the air, but I say it's just adding to the pollution. It's temporary madness. Boy, this person's a real joy to be around. Love is a chemical reaction that compels animals to breed. It hits hard, then fades, leaving you stranded in a failing marriage. Break the cycle. Rise above it. Just focus on science. Okay. Woo! Love is when you find someone who has the same wavelength of weirdness as you. Come on, raise your hand. Come on, couples. You're like, yep, I'm weird, but she's weirder. Did I tell y'all my wife and I, my wife got us kicked out of Cheesecake Factory? Last? Anyway, I won't talk about that. I won't talk about that. I was trying to be a Christian. She was. Um, this is good. This is, this is a great definition of love right here. Love is buying or love. It's buying an extra thick chocolate milkshake after you've craved one all day. We've all had that. But then your wife accidentally drops hers on the sidewalk, so you give her yours. Some of you are like, I'm not doing that. I mean, honey, that's God saying, you know, watch your figure, I guess. I'm I'll drink my... I drink my. Oh, that's bad. I shouldn't say that. Man, that's bad. Sorry. Javon will be like, yeah, okay. All right. Love is something that can't be defined, only demonstrated. That is good. Somebody smart said that. Love is a mental illness that forces us to do foolish things. <laughs> Somebody, this is good. Love is like fire. There's no telling what it's going to burn. It'll either keep your heart warm or burn your house to the ground. <laughs> Nowhere in between, I guess, right? Love, um, quote songs, love is a secondhand emotion. Love is a battlefield. I like that. Somebody wrote this, and this is good. Love is bacon. Bacon is love. Reminds me of last week, the one-liners. Smoking will kill you. Bacon will kill you. Smoking bacon will cure it. <laughs> Oh, Lord of mercy. Love is like oxygen. You get too much, you get high. You don't get enough, you die. It's also highly flammable. Love is, these are good. Now, these are good. These last three are good. Love is being able to put up with someone when you are at your worst or when they're at their worst. That's good. Love is, this is powerful. This is a great statement. Love is giving someone a weapon and trusting them not to use it against you. Ooh. But my all-time favorite, this has got to be the best definition of love that you can get. 
Love is that feeling that you get when you're at a restaurant and you see your food coming from the corner of your eye. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? You're talking, and then there's those false alarms. You're like, I'm starving. Is that ours? Is that no? And they keep on walking. And then you look at their food. You're like, did I order correctly? And you're that weirdo that stands up and you walk over to the table. What is that you have? <laughs> Who's ever done that before? I've done that many times. And then I'm like, can I change? They're like, no, you can't. Love, this is an interesting message. It's an interesting little series because I am afraid that we are all like, I know that, I know that. Why are we even talking about that? But we need to be reminded of it, not to be redundant, to be reinforced. This hour matters that we can expose our lives to the truth. So let's look at some misconceptions of love for a moment. And then let's define love because it's hard to define, but let's do it according to God's word. And let's ask ourselves the question, do we want success in life? Do we live well? Do we laugh all Often and do we love much? Well, what does that word love really mean? How does it really need to be fleshed out in order for us to have a life that's an inspiration and a memory that's a benediction? Misconceptions of love, it'll come on the screen. Um, love is often just only a feeling, some people will say. That's what we think. It's just a feeling. Love is a feeling. It's the knot in your stomach. It's a certain kind of feeling that you have. We're always searching for a feeling. We think that's all love is. We talk about falling into love, and I'm sorry, I just fell out of love. I just tripped and fell out. It's a feeling, and, and that's not true. It's not just a feeling. There's a part of it for sure. And again, you're like, Brett, I know, but we don't. We don't. People think love is uncontrollable. When we talk about people being in love, we're like, oh, I feel so giddy. I'm, my head's spinning. I'm weak at the knees. I just can't control myself. We believe that, that love is uncontrollable. It's something that just happens to us. It's just some result that we fall into, and it's something we can't really change. But, of course, that's wrong. Somebody said we need a higher quality of love. And I like that, that statement, puppy love does not last through the dog days of life. So two things this week, to close this little three-week series down, two things to ask ourselves, how do we keep love alive? That is the title of the message. I need it. All of us need it. We do live in a weird time. I don't know where we are in the end of, of all things, but the Bible says the end of days, people's love will grow cold, and you can feel it today. People are searching. We want to live, laugh, and love, but there's not a lot of laughter. There's not a lot of life. There's not a lot of love. We're trying to get, and you'll never find what you're looking for just by getting. And a lot of the reason is we don't follow God's blueprint, God's definition of love. So how do we keep love alive? We have to ask what love is, and we have to act like love acts. So what, what is love? couple of things. Now we're going to just have a Bible study. We're going to jump into Colossians. We're going to jump into 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, and we're going to kind of put the definition together according to God's Word. Love is a matter of choice. Remember that. Be reminded of that. Know that. What does the Bible say in Colossians 3.14? Over all virtues, put on love. That sounds like a decision to me. That sounds like a choice that we make which binds all things together. What, what am I talking about? Won't come on the screen, but I'm going to read verse 12, 13, and 14 of Colossians 3. The Apostle Paul says this, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Whew. Okay, those are, those are things that God produces in our life through the Holy Spirit. Bear with each other and forgive one another if you have a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And now verse 14, it brings it all home. Over all of these virtues, what virtues are we talking about? Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Put on love, which binds all of those together. Love is a matter of choice. Number two. Love is a matter of conduct. 
Love is a matter of choice. It's not something we're a victim of. It's something we choose. The Apostle Paul would not have asked us to put on something that we can't control, that we can only feel. It's a choice. Two, love is a matter of conduct. 1 John 3.18, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and truth. Love is more than what we say. It's like the guy who told his girlfriend, honey, I would die for you. And the girlfriend said, you're always saying that, but you never do it. <laughs> that's bad. I said, that's really <laughs> It's like the wife that goes to her husband, you must love football more than me. You're always watching football. To which she goes, yeah, I do love football more than you, but I love you more than basketball. <laughs> it's a matter of choice. You're like, that's stupid, but it's true. We show um, really, how we love by our actions, it's not just our words. So if that's the case and it's demonstrated, God demonstrates his love that he gave his son for us, it's an action, then how do we act like love acts? And this is the goodness of the message. This is what's needed. We're going to jump into 1 Corinthians 13. We're going to look at the love definition which many of us equate to marriage. We're like, well, I know 1 Corinthians 13. We read it at our marriage ceremony. And I told my wife as I stood there, honey, I love you. And, of course, if anything changes, I'll let you know. Um, but it's got to be every day, right? And so how do we act like love acts? This is good. This is, you need to write it down and think about it. It's very, very kind of a, it's a, just it'll dawn on you as you let this marinate a little bit this week. Uh, and think about these things because this is goodness. Ready? Number one, love is alive when it is patient. Love is dying when it's hurried, and love is dead when it cannot wait. Remember that. Love is alive when it's patient. What does the Bible say? Let's read it. 1 Corinthians 13. I'm just going to read a few verses. Some of you know this. We've heard it before at the risk of being too familiar. But this is the definition of love. Love is patient. Verse 4. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. That kind of love never fails. So act like love acts. Love is alive when it's patient. Do you allow for other people that you really have around you? Do you allow for their faults? Are you a person that they better toe the line or you get upset, you get irritated? Patience is a tough deal, man. I'm a very impatient person. Patience, hey, parents with our children, with our spouses, with our neighbors, with our coworkers, patience is difficult. The one thing that I always go to is I remember how patient God is with me has been with me. While I was a sinner, God saved me. While I was unlovable, while I've made some wrong choices. And you know what? Even as, I'm a, as of a follower of Christ now for 35 years, I go through seasons where I'm sure God's like, I cannot believe that you would take your mind to that place. I can't believe you would be that discouraged, that fearful. You would not trust me. You would understand that my love will never fail you. I'm a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And that's when I go, God, I'm so thankful that you are patient with me, that God's mercies are new every morning. His love never fails. He's a God of a second chance. Do you think about that? We get so impatient with so many people. Love is alive, though, when it's patient. Number two, love is alive when it cares. And this is what we, we need in our society, especially for us. Love is dying when it forgets. Some of you are like, oh, I forgot my anniversary. <laughs> Love's dying. Yep, it is. Uh, love is dead when it ignores. 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Love is kind. Isn't that nice? Can you define Kindness. It's like hard, isn't it? It's like, hard. how do you define kindness? 
So I gave you a definition. I'm going to give you this working definition of kindness. This is a really good real-life definition. Kindness is the ability to care for each other. It will come on the screen. Kindness is the ability to care for each other in a practical way. That's a great definition of just everyday kindness. The ability to care for each other in a practical way. If we don't define kindness, it gets a little mysterious. Like, how, how do you really flesh out kindness day in and day out? And it's interesting for me, and I people watch, and I really work on, on my life, and I'm a work in progress. And I wrote a few things down this way. It's interesting. It's often easier to be kind to a stranger than it is to be kind to the people that we're closest to. See it all the time. I even see it in churches. I'll start the big picture and we'll work down. Churches. Churches, we get so fired up. Let's be kind to a missionary in another country, but yet we won't do anything to lift a hand to reach people in the shadow of our church building if we don't watch it. That's not us. If we don't watch it, that can be the church. You see it all the time. I see, I'll, I'll start with spouses. I see sometimes spouses kinder to strangers and coworkers than they are their own spouse. They're, they're easier to, hey, you know what, that's okay. I've seen spouses get berated by spouses, just the kindness out in public. We would never do that. But it seems like the world is getting crazier. We're, very, we're not kind. People don't see kindness in our society today. We almost think kindness is weakness. How about this is a good one. I see this often. If I don't watch it, this is me. We can be kinder to other kids than we are our own kids. We can allow for their faults and, and say it's okay. My son plays baseball. Right now we're on a five-game losing streak. It's not been pretty at the old Smokey Bear den next door. But I've been watching to me. If my son doesn't do well, you know, I can really say, what's up? But his friend that batted before or after him, it's okay. You got it next time. And I can almost see my son. You know I'm right, parents. You let little Johnny and Susie do so. Oh, it's okay. Kid, kids will be kids. But your kid, rip them a new one. We're kinder, honestly, to strangers. We're kinder to strangers than we are the people that we love the most. And we really uh, we struggle to express kindness. That's why we have a billion-dollar greeting card industry in our society. That's why we don't all write notes. We don't talk to people. We cop out, right? It's a birthday. It's an anniversary. It's Valentine's. We run to Walgreens, and we jump into the greeting card section. For me, it's a five minutes or less, right? That's my goal. I'm out of there in five minutes or less. I typically like humor cards. Some of you, you cop out. You're like, it's 10 minutes before my anniversary dinner. I got to run to Walgreens. I get a card. Uh, boy, I guess that one looks good. And how do we know we're really in love with our wives? We will we'll underline a few words. And here you go. I love humor cards. My mom and sister will tell you, I've always been a humor card guy. You might think that of me. I love those cards. I saw a card the other day. It was an anniversary card. Uh, or actually, I think it was a Mother's Day card to, to the mom. It was like, hey, mom, if I had an ice cream cone, I would uh, split it with you. If I had six candles, I would give you three. If I had two apples, I would give you one. If I won the lottery, I would send you a postcard from Tahiti. I mean, I love that kind of card. I love that. But we don't express it. Kindness is something we don't express. And I'm not like hammering on us all. I want to, you're like, Brent, I know this, but we don't. You're never more like God than when you give. When you live and you laugh and you love according to God's blueprint, God's design, God's word, how he created us. In a world that is loveless, that does not understand what love is or kindness is, you realize how you stand out if you are just kind in your home, and beyond. It's amazing. Love is alive when it's secure. Write it down, verse 3. I can keep going, but let's keep moving. Uh, I, love is alive when it is secure. It is dying when it starts doubting. Put this in any relationship. It works. And is dead when it stops trusting. 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Love does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. 
Envy plus boasting plus pride equals insecurity every time. Security, if you want to know some nice, I mean, just really good stuff that we need to dwell on this week, security is always the, it's truly the key to relationships. You show me a great relationship, whether it's a marriage or friendship, and at the heart of that relationship is security. They can be vulnerable with each other. They can lay it on the line. They're not walking on eggshells. They can deal with real issues without being vengeful or bitter. Security. Love is alive when it's secure. Love is dying when it starts doubting. Husbands, you want your relationship to go south in a really quick way, you let your wife start doubting the places that you're hanging out and where you've been and who you're hanging with. And it's dead when it stops trusting. You're like, Brent, we know this, but we don't. I mean, love does not envy, it does not boast, it's not proud. Love equals security in so many ways. Love is alive when it is giving. Love is dying when it begins to exchange. And love is dead when it's all about taking. I think that's the common theme for three weeks. If love is anything, it's a giving relationship. God models it better than anyone else because he first gave. That's tough, though, because it means that we have to be vulnerable. What happens if I give and the other person doesn't give back? What happens if I take the first step and they don't meet me halfway? So many times, what happens? We, we want a good relationship but yet we settle for so much less than God wants for us. And it basically is negotiating, exchanging. I'll do this if you do that. We're all about keeping score. What a terrible way to go through life, to basically say, I did something for that person yesterday. It's their turn today. You lose the best things in life when we're constantly waiting for someone else to even the score. C.S. Lewis said this about love and vulnerability. This is kind of a weird quote from an author. C.S. Lewis said that love, really, after all, it's, it's, it's vulnerable. Love anything, and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to be sure of keeping your heart intact, you must give your heart to no one. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, that safe, dark, motionless, airless place, your heart will change. It will not be broken, but it will become unbreakable, impenetrable, and irredeemable. The only place outside of heaven where we can be safe from all the dangers of love is hell. Thanks, C.S. Lewis. What an inspiration. <laughs> but it's true. Love is vulnerable. You see it all the time. People are like, I loved once. I'll never love again. And I'm not necessarily talking about romantic love. Those are things that, yes, are a part of life. But I'm talking about love in the sense of do we love those around us? Is our life an inspiration? Do we act like love acts? So here we go. Five is a tongue twister. But you need to listen. Love is alive when it acts its way into a feeling. It's dying when it feels but doesn't act or acts but doesn't feel. And love is dead when it no longer feels or no longer acts. 1 Corinthians 13, 7, love protects and it trusts, it perseveres, it always hopes. So I want you to put stuff away, everybody, and I want you to hang with me mentally for just a few minutes. We're going to close with communion in just a few minutes. Then I'm going to pray. Pastor Michael's going to lead our Greensboro campus. Scott's going to lead our campus here. We're going to go back and sing a very old school thought, which kind of ties into last week. When you sing Amazing Grace, it's sometimes hard not to be joyful. I want you to engage with me for a minute. Think about this. Christ says this. You know this, right? If you're Christians, we understand this. If we are to love, we are to love one another as Christ loved us. Sounds great. I want you to do me a favor. Listen to this for a minute. I want you to go to the cross. We just celebrated Easter a few weeks ago. Remember the cross of Christ. Maybe you've never thought of it this way. Jesus dying on the cross 
for the world is not a picture of God loving nice people. Hang with me. Jesus dying on a cross is not a picture of God loving his friends. It's easy to love nice people and friends. It's a picture, Jesus dying on a cross, of God loving people who were really unlovable. Think about it. The Jews could hardly wait to get rid of Jesus. They planned and plotted for months. Pilate, he just wanted to get Jesus off his hands. He could have done something about it. We talked about that at Easter, but he didn't. Their hatred for Christ was so intense, they were willing to put and release a well-known common criminal from prison just to see Jesus executed. I mean, when Jesus died for me and you on the cross, he wasn't dying, and this is really interesting thought. He wasn't dying in some nice church service where everybody was singing and thanking God and thanking him for all that he did. Wasn't Jesus there hanging on a cross and everybody like, oh, I can't believe you would do that for me. We're all on our knees, just wow, what a sacrifice. It was the opposite. Jesus was dying on a cross where people hated his guts. They spit on him, they cursed him. They could hardly wait to see him die. With great joy, they watched him die. And even in the midst of that, Jesus would say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So when Christ says, and this is, means something to me, when Christ says, love one another as I have loved you, that is major, isn't it? That means we are to love people who don't love us. It, it might mean even this. We can go so far to take it to this mandate as a follower of Christ. It means we're not allowed to let how people respond and act toward us to affect how we respond and act toward them. Jesus really does mean it when he wants us to walk a second mile and turn the other cheek. We are to love people now. I had an idea, and it was from somebody last Wednesday night. So Greensboro, you'll be getting yours. Pastor Michael and Chris will get them, and you'll have them for, for Mother's Day week. Um, we got them. We, we expedited them and got them here on Friday. Went back to this just be kind idea. When you leave here in Greensboro, you'll get them online. You can actually ask, and we'll send you some as well. Grab a few of these and take them out into the community and go be kind. Take them out to a, to a restaurant. When you, when you lay this card on the table, you better tip huge. Go out and be kind. Pay it forward somewhere. Make a difference. Be kind. On the back, it says where faith and life collide, and it's our church address. Do you realize we are to love people now? Being kind is massive, but a lot of church people were not patient. We've forgotten that we're sinners saved by God's grace and mercy. We can easily go look at that person. How could they do this? How could they be this way? Be kind. Starts at home. Dads in this room, you're never more like God when you give, when you live, when you laugh, when you love your family. What is love? Love is patience. Love is kindness. Love is just the everyday details of life. What are you doing to show the love of God? Because your kids, they'll grow up hopefully in church. But if they watch you love, if they especially watch you transform, some of you have transformed your lives. You used to be a totally different person. And because of God's love, boy, you're a person of grace. You're a person of kindness. I just think today more than ever that if we walk out and be people of joy and we be people of love and kindness, we will make such a massive difference because you're the only Jesus that some people will ever see. What's your life show? And you're like, Brent, sometimes I don't have joy. Well, think of God's grace. Sometimes I, I don't know if I can love that unlovable one. Think of God, what he did through Jesus Christ on the cross for people who are so unlovely. If you have your communion element, would you grab it? And um, everybody at home, hopefully you're prepared in some way, shape, or form to take it. Greensboro, if you'll take this as well. Peel that top layer off. Hold that wafer in your hand. Peel that bottom layer off. Hold that juice in your hand. 
You know, the older I get in church, and we just did communion a, a few weeks ago, and some people ask me all the time, you know, why don't we do communion all the time? I want to do communion more, but I don't want it to turn into some religious routine that we think we deserve and that we do it to have a warm and gooey feeling. We need this moment to impact us. Think of Christ's love for us. While you and I were sinners, God died for us for our sins. His patience, even when we're not patient, even when we were unwilling and unlovable, God still loves us. Go love as Christ loved. Act like love acts. The difference is powerful. I need it, especially in the world in which we live. Take the bread and break it. Remember, eat and remember the body of Jesus Christ. God so loved the world that he gave. Take your drink and, and drink it. Remember the blood of Jesus Christ. Let's pray, God. Thank you for everyone that's locked in with us today. The power of this hour is so needed. This little series, Live, Laugh, Love, I know we know, but we don't. And I guess my prayer is the next time we walk through Hobby Lobby or Target and we see Live, Laugh, Love on some driftwood, our minds will go back to these moments. Success in life is to live well, to laugh often, and to love much. What an inspiration we can be. We live well when we give. We live well when we put Jesus Christ in the center of our lives. We move to the sidelines. When he becomes greater daily and we become lesser. Our joy is linked with our grace that you have given us, the grace that you have given to all of us, something we don't deserve, and loving. God, may we act like love acts. May we be kind and patient. May we love as Christ first loved us. Starts at home and to the world around us. Thank you. God, be in this song. Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt. God, thank you. May we be for great, forever grateful and go out and make a difference. The world needs us too. In Jesus' name we pray.